Okay, we're 9.01. Ready to get started? Everybody happy on a Monday morning? All ready to go? Yes? No? Not awake? It's not a good Monday? No. It's not a good Monday for me either. Uh, this, as again, as a quick reminder, on Wednesday, George Kassoon will be giving a guest lecture on his favorite viruses, the RDHVs, which are kind of related to the microviruses that we're going to be talking about today. On Friday, he'll have a DVD of the Lambda bacteriophage, a rather nice video, which will then be put on reserve immediately after he's done um, showing it during the lecture. Um, any questions about the next two lectures? There will not be recordings, as far as I know. Um, at this point, I don't think George is planning on doing clicker questions either. It's not on tape. I'm not implying that the stuff in the Lambda video will be on the test. The stuff in the Lambda video will be on the test, which is a week from Wednesday. And then next Monday will be review, assuming that I'm awake enough to do it. Actually, the jet lag should be good that I'll be awake then. Later on in the day might be more of an issue. Okay. Any other questions, comments, worries? Uh, my computer might die halfway through here because of the battery, which is really bad. If that's the case, we'll switch over to the um, other computer. But we at least still have enough battery for our clicker questions, so we can do that now. First one is, given what you know about the GP10 protein of bacteriophage T7, you would expect it to be encoded by an early gene, a middle gene, a late gene, or a scaffolding protein, or a DNA polymerase. Ten, five. Okay, so um, GP10 is what? Capsid protein. Capsid protein is what? It's, well, no, <laughs> a late gene. Yes, that wasn't one of the questions. <laughs> um, in terms of what kind, is it a structural protein or a non-structural protein? Say structural proteins. Structural proteins are almost always encoded by late genes, yes. So um, the middle there might be confusing, having to do with which promoters are being used for that. And it turns out, if you go back and look at the map, the, um, the promoters there are also um, particularly for those late genes. Those are the ones which are binding to the T7 RNA polymerase. Uh, I mentioned last time, no, I don't expect you to remember the names of all of the GPs as you go through any of the given viruses, but I counted, I think I mentioned GP10 in the last lecture about 12 times. So that's a pretty good indication that that's something that is at least fair game for the exam. It's not written yet. I think that's what's going to be doing on the flight back from Finland is writing the exam. So <clears throat> that being said, um, hopefully, while I am doing this, um, writing the exam, I'll actually have some time to proofread it, which um, I didn't do for this question, so don't anybody answer yet, <laughs> because E should actually be A and B. So you can all answer E now. Everyone here actually gets a point. That's a good thing. Now, um, while we discuss that, yes, and I'm not giving you a... <clears throat> so, 
surprising things about bacteriophage T7 the entry that was not known before the experiments shown in the video that we talked about in lecture. Um, only one tail fiber protein binds most of the time. There's a random walk over the E. coli host. Bacteriophage T7 is a potovirus. Bacteriophage T7 has a T equals 7 icosahedral symmetric capsid. And then um, this one is um, A and B, which is the um, correct answer. So I still have a few of you haven't voted yet. So <laughs> go ahead and do that. Uh, so yes, it is only one of the six tail fiber proteins that seems to be associating at the first interaction with what's going on in the outside of the cell. And that was the real breakthrough that they had with the tomography experiments that we talked about last time. Um, there is a random walk across the E. coli host. This is actually something which, again, they didn't know until we looked at those, although A is probably a slightly better answer than B, but B is pretty correct, which is what I noticed when I was going through this again. Um, bacteriophage T7 is a potovirus, which is the short foot virus, um, and it has a T7 icosahedral symmetric capsid. Yes, that's true. Um, and there is a portal protein, but they knew that as well. Yeah? Right. And so, again, this should be most of the time, you know, when it's interacting with the cell. And again, so not a great answer, which is why, again, I just told you the answer to it. And we're not going to be um, counting this one. Oh, somebody answered incorrectly. So it used to be all of the above then? No, because what well, wasn't known before these experiments. So E should be A and B. So um, show our results and collect, select the correct answer. Um, yay, happy, good, we get points. Um, good. So uh, other things about bacteriophage T7 that, again, those of you who need to go by, yeah, question. Uh, what exactly are where's the portal protein? Where's the portal protein? The portal protein is what's down at the one of the five-fold axis of symmetry, and that's where you have the core that basically flips itself inside out. When you have that release, it's also where the DNA gets packaged into the capsid structure. Um, and it's, uh, again, it's, this is 12-fold symmetric, so it's very different than the five-fold symmetry, which you'd normally have at one of those pentameric axes. And that's also it's interacting with the tail proteins as well. But it's that portal protein is really, you know, it sounds like, it's like what it sounds, it's a portal protein. So in and out um, for putting the, the DNA in the core machinery. Other questions? Sort of, again, this is a great you know, T7 sort of introduction or review, I should say, here. Um, again, these are double-stranded DNA phage. They have a pretty high dependence on the host, although not as much as the viruses we'll be talking about today. Um, we talked a little bit about the T phages at the end. If we have some time, I'll show you some of the plaque images that I'd hope to have for that lecture. Um, how it gets in, this is the really sort of bizarre and different aspect of bacteriophage T7 is it's the RNA polymerase, the DNA-dependent RNA polymerase that really pulls the genome out of the capsid through the portal protein inside the host, which is where it then gets uh, translated, et cetera. Uh, and then, of course, the vial polymerases, particularly the T7 RNA polymerase, the single subunit RNA polymerase which is a really great tool also for biotechnology applications and also has its own DNA polymerase. The DNA polymerase is actually much more similar to the other DNA polymerases and then it needs an RNA primer. And where does that RNA primer come from? The T7 RNA polymerase itself. So any questions about T7 before we move on and talk about single-stranded DNA bacteriophage? So again, you know, Pretty typical here. I'll do a quick review of the things we're going to be talking about, where do you find them in the first place, um, how they're an incredibly useful tool, um, and then the main stuff that people, I think, think about as far as single-stranded DNA bacteriophage has to do with replication. Um, and the replication, I think, is the key to what George is going to be talking about next time, which is the um, title of one of my latest publications. Mechanisms for RNA Capture by Single-Stranded DNA Viruses, Grand Theft RNA. And I got away with that. It's in press right here. <laughs> so, uh, but yeah, the replication of these viruses is really critical. And this brings me back to the comment I made last time about the research tying into the teaching and the teaching tying into the research. Because I haven't, hadn't talked about this before. I wouldn't have realized how 
cool the system was. And I never would have written this paper if I hadn't been teaching about this before. So um, the other really fascinating aspect about Phyx-174, it's a really tiny virus. Um, these single-stranded DNA viruses have a tendency to be really tiny, at least the virions do. Um, but putting together is really complicated. You've got all kinds of extra assembly proteins, scaffolding proteins, et cetera. And then it turns out that these kinds of single-stranded DNA viruses, particularly those infecting bacteria, at least as far as we can tell, are extremely common all over the place, including in some of the bizarre ecosystems that we work with as well. So big pictures, again, it's a single-stranded DNA bacteriophage. How it gets in turns out to be another really interesting story that was just discovered literally and published last year. Um, 2014, yes, it's 2015, yeah, last year. Um, and then the replication aspect is, again, I mentioned, uh, one of the really bizarre things is why you would want to package a single-stranded DNA genome. Why a single-stranded DNA genome? The main reason is because it's really small. But other than that, nothing, you can't do anything with single-stranded DNA. Single-stranded DNA is basically worthless until you make double-stranded DNA. And so you have to make double-stranded DNA in order to make RNA, because everything, you know, again, all these viruses, they need to have messenger RNA to make their proteins, because they're all dependent on the cellular translation process. So why bother with single-stranded DNA? And you know, my reason, of course, is because you know, they steal RNA. But um, that's rather speculative at this point. But to do that, again, they've got to first become double-stranded, and then once they become double-stranded, they've also got to then flip over and make single-stranded DNA again, which is really bizarre. You know, evolutionarily, how could this have happened? I think it's a really interesting and open question. We really don't know. And then as far as <clears throat> assembly is concerned, again, the main thing here is that we've got two different kinds of scaffolding proteins, and there's an intermediate in the assembly process called the procapsid. And this is something we'll find for pretty much all of the other, at least bacteriophage, and it's true for a lot of animal viruses as well. So, Phyx-174, this is the classic example of the microviruses. It's been studied for, wow, well, going on I think about 80 years now. A uh, couple of really fascinating things about microviruses, which are slightly different than some of the other single-stranded DNA phage are these overlapping open reading frames. Um, so yes, it's a really small genome, but it's an incredibly efficiently used genome. And actually, this is all three open reading frames um, for coding the proteins. And again, the replication is pretty well understood, mostly because people have been studying these particular viruses for a rather long time. And the structure and assembly is a lot more <coughs> um, well-known more recently. What are these microviruses? Uh, we've got. The standard microvirus, again, Phyx-174. Phyx-174 infects our friend E. coli, but there are also some somewhat nastier bacteria here, which are also infected by some very similar, um, highly related bacteriophage. And people are thinking about using some of these bacteriophage for phage therapy. So how can you treat uh, Shigella infection, a Salmonella infection? and maybe even some of the pathogenic E. coli infections. So use the phage to treat some of these. More recently, there have been a number of other viruses which have been found. Again, single-stranded DNA viruses, very small. Um, but these all infect obligate intracellular parasites. So they're sort of parasites of parasites. Um, and are potentially really interesting in terms of understanding where some of these viruses came from originally. Again, what's the evolution? Why have this single-stranded DNA life cycle? Uh, lifestyle, I should say. Life, assuming that they're alive. Uh, so again, these are various different ones. And it turns out the ones we'll talk about at the end, the ones you find really commonly in the environment, look mostly like these kinds of parasites of parasites. But first, let's talk about Phyx-174. Uh, was not quite discovered by this guy, but most of the work done by him, by the name of Robert Sinsheimer. Um, and this is the lab at UC Santa Cruz that's named after him. So it's a lab basically named after a virus, which I think is kind of cool. Uh, Single-stranded DNA genome, 
5,386 bases. Um, why is that so important? Because it was the first ever genome sequence to be completed. So in 1977, it was the first ever genome sequence to be done, partly because it was really small and because, just like we talked about with all these other viruses, you get a whole bunch of the nucleic acid out of it. And in fact, that's the one that I showed you that little tube of before, the first lecture. 10 to the 11th virovirions in it. That was this one right here. Uh, it was shown to be infectious, just the DNA itself, in 1961. So going way back in terms of virus history, almost prehistory for viruses. And then um, made with a DNA polymerase, um, so synthetic genome, as it were, in a test tube in 1977. And then there was this big deal uh, a little over 10 years ago now that Craig Venter and co. had synthesized the genome. Well, I wasn't, didn't think it was such a big deal, but they made a big splash about it. So synthesizing life, which, which they called it. <clears throat> this is a view, uh, sorry, a cartoon, not out of the textbook, but again, I think shows really quite nicely how we think about FIX-174 replication. Start out with the capsid here interacts with E. coli, gets through the membrane. We'll look at that in a lot more detail a bit later on. And then the single strand, which is packaged here, is the positive strand. And so it's, if this were RNA, it could be translated directly. But of course, it's not RNA. Um, and the first thing you need to do is make a second strand, which is here, uh, make the negative strand. Once you now have a double-stranded DNA, this works just like everything else inside the cell. You can undergo transcription, get messenger RNA. That makes proteins. Those early proteins are important for making more of your genome, which then goes around and around until you've accumulated enough of these proteins, and we'll talk about those, what they are in just a second. Then you switch over to making single-stranded DNA, those then get packaged into virions, and the virions get out. So what is in this genome? Well, a extraterrestrial genome. And you know, why an extraterrestrial genome? Because all three of the over re open reading frames were overlapping. And so um, this is, <clears throat> in fact, a citation from the New York Times on the, let's see, May 7th, 1979, you know, soon after the genome sequence was done. Scientists examine tiny viruses for messages from outer space. In the New York Times. Um, a search for messages from other worlds is focusing not on the heavens, but on certain bacterial viruses. The search in Japan is for special meaning in the coded genetic signals within the viruses. It was prompted by the discovery that genetic sequence of one virus seems more contrived than natural because of all of these overlapping open reading frames. And so at first, okay, this is yeah, crazy, you know, these Japanese, what do they know? But if you think about it, from the extraterrestrial point of view, if you bring one of these virus genomes down on the planet, what happens to these viruses? They replicate like crazy. They make many, many, many copies of themselves. And so it's sort of a self-repeating message once you were to get it here. So in fact, it's not that crazy an idea after all, at least um, to my point of view. However, I have some drawbacks as messengers in here. Um, this is uh, posted on D2L, by the way. Uh, the authors concede drawbacks to viruses as messengers. They must reach a planet whose biochemical environment is suited to the virus. Furthermore, the encoded message must survive numerous replications without becoming so altered by mutation as to destroy the message. So. FIX-174 replicates only through infection of intestinal bacteria, E. coli, but is structurally similar to other phages, all of which, the researchers suggest, may have evolved from a common ancestor of extraterrestrial origin. So bacteria from extraterrestrial origins as well. So again, I'll, I'll post this. But it was really surprising because, in fact, a lot of people had shown that you couldn't have an overlapping genetic code and have it work. Why? Mutation. So if you have a mutation in particularly this segment right here, which encodes three different proteins in three different reading frames, if you have one mutation here, this would change potentially the protein sequence of one protein. But 
also now potentially change the sequence of two other proteins as well at the same time. And hopefully you remember your genetic code is that the last position, the wobble base, is you can actually play around with quite a bit. But of course, if you're talking about different reading frames, that's going to be in one of these reading frames could be the wobble position, but in the other two, it's going to be one of the first two positions. So it's highly likely to be changing your amino acid sequence. And it turns out what was found much later is that this B gene right here is extremely mutation tolerant. It can incorporate up to about 70% um, different amino acid changes and still be functional. And more recently, Ben Fain, who wrote this chapter in the textbook, also showed that you can get away with that gene completely. And the virus can be still functional with a few other mutations in different genes. So it seems to be efficient, works well, and from an evolutionary point of view, using these extra genes in different open reading frames seems to be something that viruses have done quite a lot, and it's just been maintained right here. So um, not surprisingly, A through E, which are these genes that all have overlapping open reading frames, are not structural. The structural proteins are the ones which you're going to need to actually make your capsid. So those are ones you're going to expect to be much more constrained in terms of amino acid space, whereas these non-structural ones potentially a lot less so. An enzyme, you just need the active site, right? You don't need everything else, whereas you need lots more interactions when you think about structural proteins. So it turns out that this A star and K are actually not essential at all for the virus. You can mutate these, and the virus seems to be perfectly happy. Um, and as I mentioned before, B is highly mutation tolerant, and E is sort of not essential. But again, as is true with B, in the presence of B or the presence of E, the virus replicates faster. But in the absence of them, it can still replicate as well. Um, if you look at the genome again, those genes that are not encoded in multiple open reading frames are those which are structural. Um, F, J, and H. Um, and again, these inserted genes, those ones in op open reading frames that are overlapping, is really not uncommon in terms of how people think about inventing new genes. You've already got a gene. It's already being transcribed. If you just shift where it starts in terms of translation, that could potentially give you a new functional gene. And if that's something which is selected for you, just hang on to it. It's maintained. Uh, if you look at transcription of the genome, Almost all of the transcription is not from this A promoter. There are three promoters, A, B, and D. A, make a little bit of. B, you make a ton of. And we'll see why that is in just a second. D, you make a ton of. And then less and less of these other structural proteins. Um, again, J, F, G, and H are these main structural proteins. Um, what do those get put together in? Well, T equals 1 icosahedral capsid. Turns out that these other viruses, the microviruses that are infecting things other than E. coli and E. coli's close relatives, don't have all these overlapping open reading frames. And so maybe they're the progenitors of the Phi X174. They also have a slightly different structure with these projections at the five-fold axis of symmetry. And we'll get back um, and talk a little bit more about that later. But here is what we have in Phi X174. The F protein is the major capsid protein here that's making up your structure. The G protein is here at the five-fold axis of symmetry. The J protein seems to interact with the DNA. And then we have this funky H protein that we had no idea what it was doing until just last year. And again, you know, these are messages from outer space. Well, be that as it may. So again, don't expect you to remember all of these, but I've underlined the ones that are particularly important i.e., might want to think about those as far as next week is concerned. Um, the A protein is the critical protein for DNA replication, um, particularly for that single-strand DNA replication, which is virus-specific. It has an endonuclease activity, which cuts this positive strand RNA at a very specific site, gives you rolling circle replication, and then when it's done, it reverses that endonuclease activity. And I like to think of this as really much more of a recombinase than an endonuclease ligase. 
then the B protein is a scaffolding protein, and the D protein is a scaffolding protein. Both of these are required for optimal virus function, although we mentioned you can get rid of B um, pretty easily and the virus will still function. If you think about B, it's got 60 copies. This D protein, there are 240 copies of the D protein, really an amazing amount. If you think about the structures, because that T equals one regular icosahedrally symmetric structure. So how many do you need of your major capsid protein? 60. So there's a regular T equals one icosahedra. But on top of the F protein, which is basically this blue one here, at the five-fold axis of symmetry, you have this G protein. Five copies each, five-fold axis of symmetry. How many five-fold axes do you have? In an icosahedron, how many five-fold axes? 60 divided by 5 is, everyone want their times tables? You've forgotten them by now. I've got a calculator. It's on my phone. Why do I need to bother? So 12. They're always going to be 12. Anytime you think about icosahedron, you've got 12 five-fold axes of symmetry. So if you've got five of these proteins at each of these axes, which is also true of the F protein, then you're going to have 60 of them. On the inside of this capsid, you have 60 copies of the J protein. And then I was really confused when I first put this slide together and reading the textbook. I thought there was only one copy of the pilot protein. It turns out there's one copy of the pilot protein per pentamer. So that gives you 12 of them. Um, and that becomes really important in just a second here. So, but a regular T equals one structure with these extra projections um, of the H protein, um, sorry, the G protein at each of the five-fold axes. How does it get in? Um, the receptor seems to be, again, LPS. What else seems to bind to LPS? T7 also binds to LPS. Probably the glucose part of LPS. There's glucose present in a heck of a lot of extracellular polysaccharides, so at least in theory, it could bind to a lot of these. Only infects, again, E. coli, at least for 5 174 um, The entry is through the spikes, and it seems that G and H are important for that host range. That's basically what we had in our textbook. Last year, um, Ben Fain, together with Michael Rossman, actually solved the crystal structure of this H protein. And it was really kind of an amazing structure. And what it is, is instead of normal coiled coils where you've got two alpha helices that wrap around each other, or in some cases, like collagen, we have three alpha helices that wrap around each other. These are now 10 alpha helices that are wrapping around each other. Um, and in that process of <clears throat> excuse me, wrapping around each other, they form this pretty big hole. Now, these are present on the inside of the capsid. How do they get out? How do they polymerize? And as I mentioned before, as though 10 to 12 copies on the inside of the capsule. Each one's associated with one of these you know, five-fold axes of symmetry. So somehow, we don't actually quite know how, um, when you have the interaction of one of these five-fold axes of symmetry with the appropriate host cell, then you apparently take all of these different H proteins, assemble them into this, uh, as Ben told me one day, rather um, X-rated structure um, that sort of projects from the virion and goes through the membrane. Actually, not at all unlike the core structure, which then inverts in the case of T7. So these guys form a, a tunnel, basically, through the membrane. And the way this was shown is, again, extremely similar to how it was shown for bacteriophage T7, how that's infecting the cell as well. Through tomography. <clears throat> Each of these are individual virus particles that they, virions I should say, that they're taking pictures of after making all of these tilt series and then reassembling them all together. Here are some of those individual ones. Here's this tube. And if you look at this tube, it's almost as long as the whole virion itself. So it really does seem to be only assembled after you have the appropriate um, interactions. And then once you have that, this double strand, sorry, the 
two single strands because it's a circular genome, um, get injected and come out through here inside the cell. This is another vision, as a version of that, I should say, um, where we have this H protein. The H protein is somehow together with the panamers, and we'll see this in assembly in just a second, and that then somehow undergoes this amazing conformational change which allows the genome to be brought out inside the cytoplasm of the cell that it's infecting. Again, we don't know if it's a transcription driven, if there's some kind of replication which is happening there. Um, if you look at the internal structure of this tube, there's a whole bunch of side chains basically pointing down. And Ben, again, has this really vivid imagination. So he thinks it's kind of like um, the mouth of a lamprey where you've got all of these you know, teeth sort of facing in. And so the DNA can only go one way. It can't go back out the other way. So at least that's what he's thinking. It really doesn't have a very good um, idea on exactly how that works. Um, so this is the process. Again, there's just a link to that here. So now you've got this single-stranded DNA released inside the cytoplasm. Again, it can't do anything until it becomes double-stranded. So how does that work? We always talk about these as being single-stranded DNA viruses. Well, that's true for most of the genome, but there's a little piece of it which actually is complementary um, and can bind to itself, forms this hairpin structure. This is true in all of the circular single-stranded DNA viruses. So this structure here is pretty regular double-stranded DNA. So regular double-stranded DNA it can interact with all the proteins inside the cell that are normally going to be interacting with double-stranded DNA. But there are also a bunch of proteins inside the cell that interact with single-stranded DNA. What are those? SSBs, single-stranded binding proteins. So the single-stranded DNA binding proteins also will bind to this structure. So you've got a hairpin, a bunch of single-stranded DNA binding protein, where do you normally see a bunch of single-stranded DNA binding proteins? What do you need it for? For replication, at replication forks, where you've had the helicase that separates the two strands, and then single-stranded DNA binding protein will bind to those. What happens after you have denaturation of replication origins? You have the primase, DNA primase. It is Monday morning, isn't it? <laughs> so um, cellular DNA primase, which does what? Makes a primer out of RNA, because all DNA polymerases need RNA primers. And this then <clears throat> will extend um, through the rest of your genome using the cellular normal replicative DNA polymerase. Um, and it's circular, so goes all the way around. You've got these RNA primers. Those get degraded again by the cellular processes. These would be DNA polymerase 1, RNase H, et cetera. They get ligated together. Now we have a double-stranded DNA genome. Now we're happy. Now we can undergo transcription. Again, we talked about this before. You have the D protein coding gene, which is here made from the P, B promoter, PD promoter, a little bit from the A promoter, but that's the one you have 240 copies of. You have huge amounts of this D protein. You have a lot less of some of these other proteins, particularly the overlapping ones, because they don't bind the ribosomes very well. And again, that's not surprising if you think about these being relatively new genes. There must have been you know, some kind of mutation that happened that allowed the ribosome to bind there. You probably can't change too much of it because you'd be also changing the sequence of these other genes as well. Um, turns out that there's also a lot poorer codon usage here for E. What is codon usage? That's the individual codons that you're using to encode any of the given proteins. Um, that is determined by what tRNAs you have inside the cell and the amount of any given tRNA. So you'll have a whole bunch more of some tRNAs that will recognize particular codons and a lot less of some other tRNAs that will recognize other codons. And so a suboptimal codon usage means you have a lot less of some of that protein 
than you would of other ones. And again, that's exactly what you'd expect for an overlapping protein right here, a new protein which has just been created, if you want to be, again, totally over-anthropomorphizing, over by the virus genome. The H protein, the one that forms that amazing 10-stranded helical structure for entry, um, that, it turns out, also has a lot less uh, optimal codon usage, and that apparently is how you end up with only 12 of them. Now, this seems to be a pretty inefficient process, just, you know, not as good codon usage, and you have to have probably exactly 12, although 10 seems to be what you need to get that um, structure, which is built to get into the cell. And so this basically seems to be, we don't care how efficient and exactly the amount of numbers any of these proteins are, it works. And again, it's an evolutionary process. As long as it works, it's good enough. And it turns out for Plax-174, it works so well that you get the first virus particles, so the end of the latent phase, uh, no, sorry, the, the eclipse phase, because you actually have these inside before they get lysed and come out, after about five minutes. So five minutes between infection and virion production. Even in something growing as fast as E. coli, that's pretty darn fast, um, really impressive. And in fact, when we grow these things, you actually want to slow it down. You lower the temperature um, so that you can get uh, better control over it. So you've got double-stranded DNA that gets transcribed. You make all the appropriate proteins. One of those proteins is the A protein. And so the A protein is really the critical part of getting single-stranded DNA replication to happen. So what happens? The A protein will make a nick in your double-stranded DNA at a particular position. And it turns out that position is right where you'd have otherwise the stem loop structure as well. What that does is, unlike your classic endonuclease, it just would make a cut, and then you've got free ends. This <clears throat> A protein is, as I mentioned before, really a lot more like a topoisomerase. What it does as a tyrosine. Tyrosines have what kind of group at the end? An OH at the end. So basically that OH pretends to be the OH on your nucleic acid chain. And so that hooks up to the 5' prime phosphate. And so here you have this <coughs> circular blob here which sorry, represents the A protein. So now it's bound to the 5' prime end. But it's also made a free 3' prime end. If a free 3' prime end, you have a template. What's this great for? Free 3' prime end, template. What do DNA polymerases need? Free 3' prime ends and templates for extension. So this provides somewhere for the cellular DNA polymerase, DNA polymerase 3, to extend from here. Of course, it's now double strands. So you need to separate these two strands. How do you separate DNA strands? Helicase. Um, and the helicase here is part of the A protein activity. And then you replicate your way around the genome. You get to the end here. And now the A protein that was bound to the 5' prime end with its tyrosine just reverses that activity. That 5' prime end gets hooked up to the 3' prime end of the DNA, which has been made, and the A protein cuts again, provides a new template for going around the genome. So this is the process that you do for single strands. And I, this is the figure from the textbook. I made my own little animation for this because I think it's a little bit easier to follow. Uh, here we have our infection. Here's our capsid in red um, with the quote-unquote single-stranded genome in the middle, because it's this double-stranded piece here. Sorry about the white background. So you have infection, again, the H protein. This comes inside the genome. Then you have the cellular DNA polymerase, which will replicate its way around the genome. So now you've got double-stranded DNA. But now, this is where the exciting stuff happens. So here's our rep protein for our viruses. You can think this is the A protein now. It will bind to and cut something in this sequence. But what this sequence actually looks like is not entirely clear because it can base pair 
in a whole bunch of different ways. It could be base paired like this, it could be base paired like this, or it could be base paired like this. So exactly what the structure is that the A protein actually binds to and cuts is not entirely clear. Um, but it's something like this. Um, so again, these are all because this forms a hairpin normally in your single-stranded genome. Both of those strands should form hairpins, like you have down here on this side. Or they could be completely base paired with each other. Or since this red one is complementary to this blue one, it must also be complementary to this green one over here. So there are lots of different ways that you could be base pairing here. But be that it may, as it may, it cuts here and then binds to the 5 prime end, goes way around the genome, re-ligates it, that piece is done, and you go through another cycle there. So I want to go back and do that again. Yes? Do this step back here quickly. Oh, my attempts at animation here in PowerPoint. So um, cuts was going to ligate to the 5 prime end of the tyrosine at the back of the arrow, and the cellular polymerase will replicate your way around the genome at the end, reverses that reaction, cuts again, goes around and does this process again. Yeah? How do you say that it's like at the end? Did you say it reverses the 5 prime to the 3 prime? Right. And so here, this process, um, so it's gone around the genome once. This is that you know, green one here. It gets to this point where it had cut it the first time. And so to cut and join the new 5 prime end to the tyrosine, which is on your rep protein or the A protein, that then exchanges, and this is why I think of this more of as a chopar isomer, it's much more of an exchange of the OH on your tyrosine for the OH which is on the DNA. So, um, yeah, a, a pretty, as I call it, um, Baroque process. Just as an overview here, what gets released inside the cytoplasm is here, this mostly single-stranded. That gets replicated to double-stranded. So it's double-stranded. Then you have the activity of the A protein, which cuts and then gives you your template so you can replicate your way around the genome here. So that's how these single-stranded DNA viruses replicate. How they steal RNA, George will tell you about on Wednesday. So we've replicated our genome. We've done all of our transcription. We've made our proteins. Now we need to put the whole thing together. Um, and this is, the, I think, the real breakthrough that Ben Thane has done. And if you're interested in more of the details, um, the link is down here at the bottom um, to his web page. But what he showed through some really nice analysis of mutants is that you have the F protein, which is that major capsid protein, which comes together and basically forms pentamers. The G protein, which is the spike, comes together and forms pentamers. Um, that, just in and of itself, these are actually really pretty stable. But to get those to come together and actually form an icosahedral particle, then you need the first of these scaffolding proteins. So the B protein pulls these two guys together to give you one of the pentameric subunits. And how many of those pentamers do you need to make an icosahedron? Twelve. Good. We're learning. Um, so those twelve, then, need to come together. How those come together is through the activity of this second protein, which is the D protein, that fits around the outside of the G protein and assembles this whole thing together, basically pulls all five of those, sorry, all 12 of those pentamers together in order to make you an icosahedral structure. And that's what's called the procapsid. Um, and this is the intermediate that you have to have to get everything together. Now what you have are all of these extra scaffolding proteins. You've got the B protein, you've got the D protein, but those aren't part of your final capsid structure. So you've got everything together. Now you need to basically take everything apart, but also there's something missing in all of these. What's missing? The DNA. the DNA, exactly. The DNA is missing. So how do you get the DNA in? Well, you add H protein, and then this C protein is added. And it appears that what happens is you have rolling circle replication that was happening before. That's with the <coughs> activity of the A protein. 
But now instead of making just these single-stranded DNAs out in the cytoplasm, these get made and put into the procapsid, probably through these are the holes which are present in the D protein. You go around, this is finished. Now, once you're done, you have that reversible activity of the A protein, which probably shouldn't be shown down here at the bottom. We've got our you know, double-stranded template. In fact, this whole process should be here right at one of these pores because it appears it puts that single strand in and then re-ligates it, and that's the single-stranded piece which goes into your capsid. Once that's done, this whole complex seems to dissociate and go off to the next procapsid in order to put everything in there. Once you have the DNA on the inside, that's pushing out all of the B protein, which is that internal scaffolding protein. Remember, that's what held the penomers together in the first place. So the DNA going in seems to push B out. Once you have the whole thing which is assembled, now D falls off, and you have your final virion structure. It's an overview that's shown here. Here's the procapsid on the left-hand side. Here's the virion on the right-hand side. One thing that should be really obvious is that the procapsid is a lot bigger than the final virion. And what is happening when you get D removed, there's also a compression, a compaction of the virion. So it makes itself smaller. And that's probably closing up these holes that the DNA came into in the packaging process, putting it all together there. So now you make a whole bunch of virions. You still need to get out. That's the activity of the E protein. The E protein seems to function a lot like penicillin. What does penicillin do? It just basically blocks the assembly of more peptidoglycan. And that process then blocks. And so as the cells are growing, as those cells grow, they don't have peptidoglycan there anymore. It's not holding everything together. And so basically, the cells kind of pull themselves apart. And so the lysis process is really under cell growth. It pops them. Yeah. Yeah, so first, yeah, the question is, you know, when is this happening, basically? What's the process? So how are you getting assembly? Is assembly happening while you're making double-stranded DNA, or is it happening afterwards, basically, is the question. What has to happen afterwards, because you're not even going to get the RNA to encode all of those proteins unless you've had your double-stranded DNA. So you have to have double-stranded DNA. And one of the things that I kind of skipped over and probably should have mentioned um, in more detail, let's back up here, um, is that this process of single-stranded DNA going to double-stranded DNA, this clearly has to happen right at the beginning, right as you have infection. But you also need many more copies of this double-stranded DNA down here, and not just one in order to make enough particles to be able to go through the process. So after you've gone through one round of rolling circle replication, this now will serve as a template to make more double-stranded. So you end up with about 12 to 15 copies of the double-stranded replicative form DNA um, before you switch over to packaging it into capsids. So yes, you have to have double-stranded DNA before any of this can happen. Okay, so again, gets out that process. So the last couple of minutes, I want to talk about some of the newer stuff which is happening with these single-stranded DNA viruses. Again, um, Craig Venter's group was really excited about the plaques that they got with their synthetic life. They synthesized life in 2003. Um, my plaques, I think, look way better than their plaques. Um, so these are those plaques, again, that we get from FIAX-174 infection. Um, they're really big. Um, and again, that's partly because it's only a five-minute replication cycle. Um, then what I wanted to talk about is some of the more recent work from my lab having to do with this amazingly gorgeous place in Lassen Volcanic National Park, which is our main field site. It's a place called Boiling Springs Lake. Uh, the temperature is 50 degrees C plus. 
The pH is about 2.3. Um, it's a lake, and you can actually just barely see in the background here. These are some of our botanist colleagues here, collecting some of the mosses around the outside. Um, none of my students wanted to swim out in the lake and collect samples. Go figure, you know, 50 degrees, pH 2, who cares? Um, so we had the mechanical engineers design this little remote control boat here. The Jolly Roger on the top was their idea, not <laughs> our idea. Um, but this boat, um, I actually got into a bit of a trouble with this boat because it's a motorized vehicle in a wilderness area. <laughs> Don't get me started on that whole thing. Uh, but it's basically a fish finder. That's what this um, white thing is on the top. Um, paddle wheel on the other side. And then a canister in the middle so at least in theory we could collect samples. We never ended up collecting samples here. Uh, but it also has a GPS. And basically what we're able to do with this, we're calling an ROV, you know, way more exciting than a remote controlled boat, remotely operated vehicle, um, was to map the whole lake in terms of temperature um, and in terms of depth. Because if you look here, you can't tell how deep it is. It's filled with all this sediment. Um, so we were able to, for the first time, actually show how deep this lake was, what the temperature gradients were, et cetera, um, just by going out and driving this thing around the lake. Um, what did we find? Well, I wouldn't be telling you about this in this lecture if we hadn't found some microvirus-like sequences. And so these are the microvirus-like sequences which we found in Boiling Springs Lake. Most of them pretty closely related to these parasites of parasites. So you remember the chlamydia phage. Um, chlamydia is an obligate intracellular parasite. <clears throat> and Lots and lots of sequences that people have found in the Sargasso Sea. This is SAR here, stands for Sargasso Sea. GOSS stands for Global Ocean Survey. And BSL stands for Boiling Springs Lake. That's what we found. And so these are where our virus sequences are relative to all of these other ones. So they're clearly quite different from most of these other sequences, but still clearly related. And are you guys used to looking at these kinds of phylogenetic trees? Yes, no? Explain them, at least briefly. So basically, the length of each of these bars represents the number of nucleotide changes back to a predicted common ancestor. So for instance, you know, this one has a certain number of changes relative to this common ancestor. This one has a certain number of changes relative to this common ancestor. But the really important thing when you're looking at these trees is not so much the length of these, but the numbers that you have at any of these given junctions. Because what you do is you take all these sequences that are lined up with each other, you throw them into a computer program, and they give you a bunch of trees. But there are lots of different potential options for this. And these, what these numbers mean is how often you got that particular tree and those particular things together. So 67% of the time, these two sequences were together. But what that means is 33% of the time, they actually weren't. 100% of the time, these sequences are together. And that means these are clearly all related to each other. 69% of the time, this set of sequences was together with this set of sequences, which is a lot less certain in terms of thinking about these things. So number of groups of different single-stranded DNA viruses, and our friend Phi 174 is all the way over here on the outside, clearly quite different from all the rest of these. So my graduate student, Jeff Diemer, um, studied this oops, and looked at all these really cool modeling, which we don't have here, but um, looked at also where these proteins should fit on one of these microvirus structures. And it turns out that just through modeling, and this is again Jeff Diemer's work here, um, he was able to show that the predicted proteins that we find in Boiling Springs Lake looked a lot like some of these known Gokusho viruses, which seem to be, again, infecting the parasites of parasites. We have no idea what these guys are actually infecting in our Boiling Springs Lake sample but they're clearly there, they're clearly a whole bunch of them, and we have some ideas on exactly how they could be interacting here, but also how they can survive under these extreme conditions. You remember, it's low pH, high temperature. 
And so the structures of these proteins are giving us some clues about how they're actually going to be able to give you this real extra stability. And if you want to know more about this, wait until we finally get our paper written or go and look up Jeff's um, PhD thesis. So finish up, wanted to talk a little bit about some evolutionary aspects of what's going on with these single-stranded DNA viruses. Strangely enough, these single-stranded DNA viruses of bacteria are really similar in terms of how they replicate, in terms of their proteins to both plants, viruses, and animal viruses, and that's going to lead in nicely to what George will be talking about on Wednesday. Um, they're clearly all T equals one, icosahedral, single-stranded DNA virus. Why you would want to have all of these? They're present all over the place. Basically, wherever you look, you find these single-stranded DNA viruses. It's been really hard to quantify how much they are. You remember those little spots that we looked at? Lecture one, little tiny spot, represents a virus. Well, it turns out that these virus genomes don't bind very much of these nucleic acid binding dyes. Why? Because most of them intercalate. So they'll go into double-stranded DNA and then fluoresce. Well, these are single-stranded DNA, so they don't fluoresce very well. So if anything, some of the counts of some of these viruses that are out there are potentially really, really low. So these might be more prevalent than that potovirus I talked about last time for SAR-11. Um, still very much up in the air, and it's one of the big problems in the field is they're trying to figure out what exactly is going on there. So that's it for our microviruses.